libraries has a pretty comprehensive um, suite of stuff um, that uh, encompasses not just citation stuff, but also thinking critically about generative AI overall. Um, a lot of Canadian universities have done some really good work on academic integrity in general and their work on generative AI and academic integrity. I found to be really instructive. I've been to a few conferences this year um, to uh, learn from some of my Canadian peers. Um, the Purdue, Purdue OWL, which I mentioned, is a really, if you're familiar with the OWL, a lot of folks give it out to students as a resource. Um, it has a lot of stuff going on. It has an article about artificial intelligence and citation. Um, and all of these are available. Um, you can see the tiny URL there. AIC Resources um, is a um, reference to our SharePoint page, which I'll show you at the end. Um, but all these links to all of these specific tools are there. So um, the one that I'll show you here, um, just as an example of some of the ways some of these resources are formatting their advice. Um, I think students really benefit from seeing the architecture of a citation, really kind of like pointing out which pieces of the citation are what. Um, and so this is from the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater, and it explains kind of the anatomy of, of a citation. Stuff like this, really useful um, <clears throat> for students. Um, I'll admit. So <laughs> that's it. I showed you some really useful tools for citing AI, and now you can give students some advice on citing AI, right? Um, for those of you who just arrived, you're like, what am I doing here? This is the end. Um, but I'm just kidding, because I assumed you brought questions today. Um, I assumed you're here to get something out of this session, and um, it would be great if you could just take a minute and either think about your questions, jot down some of your questions. If you're in Zoom and uh, you want to put a couple questions in the chat, I'd love to have them so I can make sure to either get to them today or respond to them um, respond to them sometime afterwards or in subsequent sessions. So like just like two or three minutes, just think about some of the questions you have, maybe even based on what you saw so far, and maybe why this, that couldn't be the end of the presentation. Just like two, three minutes of thinking. Oh, whenever you're ready for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I'm a second, this is my second semester of teaching upcoming here. In the spring, I taught um, a journalism class. I had a student who, um, you know, I gave them uh, a writing assignment that they were they completed in class, um, sort of a survey, and then telling me about their career goals and all that. And the writing was at not, not a high level. Then when he started turning in papers and assignments, the writing was incredibly concise mm -hmm. and clear, but somewhat vague as though a computer had written it. Yeah. Um, I asked him if he was, using AI, uh, I didn't have any sort of prohibition for it in my course. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. And I asked him to stop. Um, he continued regardless of, of what I said. Mm -hmm. If we say you have to cite the AI mm -hmm. and then a student chooses not to, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's very clear to us that the writing is not in adherence with what we know to be their writing ability. Yeah. Is there anything we can even do about that? Yes. So I'm going to answer your question really briefly and then make sure that you know that you can get in touch with me about that specific question or like that family of questions mm -hmm. separately too. So I run the Office of Academic Integrity. Um, I've gotten, this has been our bread and butter all year, questions like this, <laughs> um, really, is uh, what do I do? I think a student has written this using generative AI. That's prohibited in my class. What do I do? And the really short answer is, like, if you think it was written by generative AI and that's not permitted in your class, you should call us, academicintegrityatamerica.edu, email us. We'll kind of go with you through whatever is going to happen, if anything's going to happen. That's the short story. The long story is, well, uh, we can't always know for sure. We can't always meet the standards of evidence that the Academic Integrity Office and our policy offers to students. And so um, from the perspective of what I can offer in this session, and like I said, like send me an email if you wanna talk more about the kind of like adjudication, but if this is the case, how do I get this to stop? If your goal is like no AI, um, is giving transparent guidelines 
about how to acknowledge sources. So like if, for example, I rewind a little bit and you said to that student, I need you to acknowledge your use of AI. It's possible that a student's like, well, how I used it to brainstorm, how I used it to check my grammar, how I used it to um, generate a correct citation. And so um, the premise of this session is really um, uh, that if you're gonna allow use, you're gonna need to give guidance about how to do it responsibly. And then if it seems irresponsible, that's when you get in touch with my office for a different reason, unfortunately. Um, so this gets at some of the challenges. Yeah. Oh, we also have another question from the chat. Um, how to indicate how or to what degree the gener uh, generative AI is used? What was the first part of the question? Uh, how to indicate how or to what degree uh, AI is used. Yeah, um, that's that's the challenge, right? How to indicate what was uh, generated using AI, um, to what degree it was used, because our typical mechanisms for citation are probably not going to do it. Um, so to kind of make sure we're on the same page about this, um, students are using generative AI, right? Yes, they are. Um, that is a headline from what is still, I think, the most the, the most popular, the most read article in the Chronicle of Higher Education this year. Um, it was written by a student. The title is, I'm a student. You have no idea how much we're using chat GPT. Most of the surveys that I'm reading uh, are between uh, spring 2023 and fall 2023. So still, it feels like old now. Um, we'll probably see another round of surveys in fall 2024. Um, in 2023 spring, 30% of college students in the intelligent.com poll said they frequently use chat GPT. Many surveys from fall 24, including one that was conducted by Turnitin, it's a yearly survey, um, said 50% plus students have used chat GPT or other generative AI tools at least once. So we're, we're seeing that students have um, really uh, become, I wouldn't even say familiar, they know it's there and they've used it or at least um, taken the time to do something with it. Um, but in the higher ed landscape, we're seeing a lot of challenges with um, instructors who are suggesting tools um, without maybe knowing that they're not the former versions of themselves. So the example I gave before, Grammarly, uh, 2009 uh, came on the market as a grammar checker that people liken to spell check, uh, but now it's an AI powered tool that can do a whole lot more. Um, and it may not be things that you want students to do. So if in your assignment you say, students are permitted to use Grammarly on this assignment, you may be permitting more than you think you're permitting. That's what the session's about tomorrow. Um, the other factor here I think it's worth mentioning is that a lot of times we assume students are comfortable in digital spaces, that there are digital natives that because they grew up uh, with digital tools at their fingertips, that they're comfortable and they're familiar and they're able to navigate those tools. And by and large, research shows us that they're not. They're not really troubleshooters. They, especially when it comes to being critical about those tools. And so um, those, those are, I think, three key pieces before we consider the questions of citation. I think that going back to this core question of what citation is and what it does and what we typically use it for as academics, but also the expectations of citation outside of the academy, um, we want to give others credit for their ideas. Uh, ideas are the currency of the marketplace in academia, but also the currency of intellectual space outside of academia. Um, we want to establish a sense of authorship. This is how people gain uh, authority and credibility in our society. Um, and we want to establish a kind of process of research in general. This is at the core of why we cite sources. Um, there's also this kind of like trailing that we share our sources so that we can establish the trail of information that led us to a particular point and it establishes a kind of trail for other researchers to follow if they want to, right? And so you can probably already see that some of the key ways, the key reasons we cite become problematic when we think about them in conjunction with how generative AI works. So like in with most gener generative AI tools are dynamic. So that means like if I put in a prompt like summarize the plot of the great Gatsby and you put in the same prompt two seconds later, the outputs will be different. 
They're not going to be hugely different because the plot of the Great Gatsby is the plot of the Great Gatsby, right? But they're going to be um, a little bit different. These tools are using data that they're, that's constantly being scraped. And so that means that there is no dynamic source. This is the reason why if you have a student that you think is using ChatGPT to write a paper, you can't just like put your prompt into ChatGPT and compare the output to the student's paper. It's not a dynamic, it, it's not a static text that you can compare it to. Um, so creating a trail um, is complicated. It's not simple in the way we think of um, uh, scholarly sources or the ways we typically cite in academic spaces. Um, how do we account for author's work when the concept of an author is complicated, right? Is AI an author? Is it creating? Uh, in some ways, like you could argue that there is a creativity to putting things together that may or may not belong, right? Um, but do we account for an author uh, at, when we're using generative AI tools? And then acknowledging sources, the concept of sources. AI is not a source. Um, it collects things, it provides access to things, um, but it's not a source of information in the traditional sense. Um, so that complicates the ways we think about um, sources. So complicates the way we think about citation, complicates the way we think about sources. Um, is AI research? Well, AI tools can do a lot of things. They can outline, they can brainstorm, they can give feedback, they can analyze data, they can suggest sources. But is that a source? I wanted to show you, uh, this is a list of chapter titles from Ethan Mollick's book. Um, Ethan Mollick, if you haven't heard him talk or read any of his blogs, he's great. He's on the business faculty at Wharton. Um, this book came out uh, was like late spring, Co-Intelligence, Living and Working with AI. I recommend it. I learned a lot from it. It was really interesting. Um, it tapped into a lot of things that I was already kind of thinking about. Um, but his chapter title is AI as a person, AI as a creative, AI as a coworker. AI is a tutor, AI is a coach. He's never got AI as research here because this really gets at sort of the ways AI functions um, that are super different than the way we think about research in the traditional sense. So that feels like an enormous set of complications to deal with. It's complicated because it's different from how we normally cite. It's complicated because it's not a traditional way we think about sources. And it's complicated because it's not really research. So mm -hmm. do our traditional systems of citation even, are they even useful to us here? No. And the answer is, well, not really, <laughs> not really. Um, so I think this brings us to some questions that are really important to consider before we even get to this, the firm, the firm now. Um, thinking about how you permit, or do you permit the use of generative AI in your class? And if you want to think about that or see examples of that or some language you can use, it's on our SharePoint. I mentioned that I'll show you that later. Um, you should um, identify what kinds of tools are okay to use, what sources of help are okay to use. Um, and what it's okay to use AI tools to do. So one of the things I'll talk about in my session tomorrow and also on Friday is because the brand names of tools change all the time, um, it may be most helpful to talk to students about what functions it's okay to use the tools to perform instead of the brand name. So for example, it's okay to use generative AI tools to help you brainstorm is more um, effective than it's okay to use Grammarly because Grammarly is a changing product that you can't always keep up with. Um, whereas you do, you should know on each of your assignments, like, oh, it is human work of brainstorming that students need to do on their own. You cannot use these tools to brainstorm or it's okay to use a machine to help you brainstorm on this assignment. Um, and so identifying the sort of task or function, it's okay or not okay to use a tool to perform um, is what I would recommend. Um, I also have, this is on our SharePoint too, but um, Vox had a video in December called AI Can Do Your Homework, Now What? It's a really excellent um, video <laughs> that includes voices from faculty and students, and um, they have some helpful ways of thinking about AI that have, um, I think, informed a lot of our conversations over the course of the spring. You can give it to students. Students really are interested in talking about it as well. 
Um, so transparency is really the big thing. No, our traditional formats of citation fall apart kind of when we're trying to apply it to generative AI. So then what? Then what do we do? What can we do? Um, transparency is really the, the big goal. How can you help students be transparent about what they're doing and what they're using? And some of the ways I've seen people do that and some of the things the literature suggests about best practices for doing that. Um, so in addition to a references page or bibliography, asking students to submit a resources page. And this is actually really interesting when you think about this, not just in terms of generative AI, but asking students to account for other ways they've gotten help. Have they gone to the writing center? Have they gone to the digital research lab? Have they um, had a parent or a friend read their, read their piece? It really asks them to think critically and be sort of metacognitive about um, the work that they've done. Um, a reflection activity. Um, a lot of folks are using kind of reflection memos where they're asked to describe what kind of tools they've used and how and why and would they use them again. Um, adding some kind of presentation component where students are asked to talk either to you or to each other or to a whole, the whole class about their experiences. So not just the content of what they've created, but also their process. Um, and the same with other kinds of conversations that they structure. These are some of the ways that I think we're moving past, past or maybe alongside citation, because there are, like I said, still ways that citation style guides are offering citation mechanisms. Um, depending on your assignment, if they might come in handy. But I think revised citation guidance should account for these things. Um, AI literacy is a term I think you're gonna hear throughout the year. Um, and this really is related to information literacy and other kinds of literacy. Um, but the sort of awareness of research dispositions, critical thinking about information, where does this information come from? Why am I choosing this source of information? Um, analyzing the context and authority of that information. Um, you wanna give students a chance to do that. So if they're using an AI tool, um, you wanna know some of those things, some of the things about it that get at those questions. The same with the second one, reflecting on help. One of the things I found in the past year is that students often um, have a different definition of help than my definition of help. Um, so a student will say like, oh, I just used it to help me get ideas. Um, and when I think of that, I think like, oh, you just got like a couple, like a, a list of a list of things, right? And it's like, no, it just generated like six paragraphs and then I move some words around. And it's like, that's not help. That's that's definitely not what I was thinking when you said um, help. But also, like uh, even things like the Writing Center, which has um, trained folks to talk to students about their writing that respects their agency and authority as individual writers, um, versus a tutor that's paid, versus a website that calls itself a tutor um, that you put in your credit card and you get a paper. So there's like this huge help spectrum that I think students need help. Um, making sense of. And then the last one is sort of connecting to some ethical reasoning questions. Um, there's no doubt that there are risks associated with using generative AI for the user that is unfamiliar with the tool and potentially with the subject matter of its output. So we have students who are using AI tools, but they don't have the knowledge or skills to know if they can trust the output or not. So you want to give them a chance to think about like, are there biases here I should be aware of? Are there hallucinations I should be checking, vetting, verifying? Um, are there labor issues, environmental issues, um, privacy issues, other impacts that I want to be aware of and sort of put into my decision-making matrix, right? Like maybe I decide that the benefit outweighs some of those risks or challenges, but getting students to sort of identify those and engage with them is a, a kind of ethical reasoning. So I think scholarly work is also a really useful um, model and way to get our community thinking about guidance that makes sense uh, for, for our students. Um, scholars are using generative AI across disciplines. Um, definitely in the sciences is where um, the most sort of writing about that fact is happening. Um, Nature did a survey in uh, fall 2023. 30% um, 30, 30 of respondents said they had used generative AI tools. That notebook page uh, on the right hand side talks about some of the ways they were using generative AI tools. Um, and conducting literature reviews 
was one of the most popular uh, uses by scholars of generative AI tools, which uh, makes sense. Uh, you can conduct a literature review in five minutes versus seven years um, in terms of the speed of some of these tools and some of the capabilities that they really have. Obviously, there's all kinds of problems, risks, and concerns that would come with doing that. Um, but, uh, but a lot of folks said that um, using AI tools for editing and for translating was a huge part of what drew them to those tools also. A lot of professional organizations, um, scholarly entities, public publications, journals for dis different disciplines have made statements about responsible use of AI. And my suggestion is if you're an active, practicing active scholarship, you should look at these in the journals that you traffic in anyway. Um, but it's useful to look at these in your field as a way to come up with ideas for what to talk to students about and how to talk about them. This is from COPE, which is um, the Organization on Professional Ethics. Um, one of the things that they highlight is that they want people to acknowledge how an AI tool was used and which tool was used. And they're suggesting disclosing the, in, the, in a materials and methods section. And that's something I've seen a lot of folks doing, whether they were doing it already, right? Like a lot of scholarly articles, scholarly genre of writing often has method and materials section. If yours doesn't, you might consider adding that into an assignment so that you're giving the student a venue to say, these are some of the materials or some of the methods that I was using. And so in that spirit of disclosure, that's um, oftentimes running alongside what's happening um, in the discipline. Um, but like I said, a lot of different uh, entities are making these statements. So these three are from uh, Elsevier, uh, Springer, and I can't remember the third, or the third one's from, it's at the bottom of this. It looks like Sage. Oh, thank you. Um, and see, so a lot of these you're going to find are in the sciences. Some uh, in the humanities haven't gotten there yet. I met with uh, the art history department last week, uh, and they were like, we're not seeing in our most popular journals any statements at all about responsible use of AI. And so you can kind of see um, that there are some folks that are attending to it already that you can draw from, um, and in other disciplines, not at all. So it would have been awesome if I had used an AI tool to do a comprehensive literature review of all of the policy statements and journal statements and professional organization statements about the use of generative AI. But I did this the old fashioned way and just looked at as many as I could find. And this is kind of what I distilled. These five things I saw as being kind of common or, um, or really uh, kind of upfront in a lot of the statements that I read. This focus on transparency. Journals want authors to be transparent about what kind of tools they're using and how they're used. Um, the use of a method section to identify or describe the use of generative AI tools and data collection and analysis especially. Um, citations, acknowledging AI tools that are appropriate for the field and the type of material. Um, some level of awareness of risk including bias, um, hallucinations, and other limitations. Um, and then the focus on verification and validity. So journals want to see authors um, making assurances that they've tested the accuracy of all the, AI, the generative AI materials they've used. So these are things that I saw um, professional organizations' statements having in common. And I think these actually could really inform the way you decide to talk to students about attribution expectations for generative AI in the classroom. So on, a, on the most practical level, I think um, before the, the fall semester begins, I think rethinking and revising syllabus and assignment language to acknowledge uh, your policy on generative AI. You may have different policies for different um, types of assignments, that's okay. You probably want a, sil a syllabus language that acknowledges um, the variety uh, in your class. Um, consider some kind of extra citation. I'm using extra citation as an outside of traditional citation um, to acknowledge generative AI resources or resources of any kind beyond the bibliography. Um, and then think about how uh, strategies from professional and scholarly journals and organizations can offer you models, ways to talk to students or um, guidelines to present to them, depending on the course level, um, that can help you kind of give students that 
level of guidance. Um, I mentioned that we have a SharePoint site. Um, this is the main page, the Academic Integrity Office's main page. So it's everything academic integrity, not just AI. Um, the QR code should work, and then there's a tiny URL there. Um, I'm A. Thomas at American, and our office is Academic Integrity at American. I'll highlight what we just posted um, a few days ago, which is uh, the fall 2024 guidance that's specific to AI. So this material in the top left is a really long PDF that's our complete guide. Um, and so it has everything from um, syllabus language to a little bit more developed thinking about how to execute each, each uh, kind of category. Um, if you're thinking, oh, I really just want to start thinking big picture and develop a policy on my own, our office's five things can help kind of get things going. Um, this is a series of questions to consider with colleagues. I mentioned that I visited with the art history department uh, the other day. They started with these questions. Um, they worked out some stuff on their own. They invited me back. They showed me their process. Now they have shared syllabus language that is awesome. It was a really great process. If you have colleagues that are teaching similar classes, um, if you have a department that's really looking for guidance on this, um, these questions are helpful and I'm happy to help if you want to get in touch. And then um, this is a little tree that helps you know. Um, I think I have a student who may have used generative AI. I want to um, I want to know like what to do now. Um, there's a little decision tree that can kind of help you work through that. Um, and then at the end is a bit about detection, which tells you a little bit about what our office thinks about that. Um, so the one on the top left is the comprehensive complete guide, and then the rest of these are like smaller pieces. So you can kind of not have to consume the really long one to get to uh, what you're interested in. A couple of things I'll point to also are sort of um, things that I often recommend to people. Um, my session on Grammarly from Ann Barron uh, in the winter is up on the SharePoint as well. If you're curious about Grammarly, how it works, or ideas for giving guidance about responsible use of Grammarly, um, the slides are up there. Um, Ezra Klein, uh, his podcast on his podcast, Ethan Mollick was a guest. Mollick is the book that I mentioned before. Uh, it's an, it's an interesting podcast, and it raised a lot of questions for me about AI tools. Um, Jose Bowen and Eddie Watson's book, Teaching with AI, has a lot of really practical suggestions. You might agree with some, you might not agree with others, um, but I think it's meant to be a really hands-on um, and useful and useful tool. Um, that is. That is the end. And so that means I can uh, address questions you have or talk through any issues that you felt like, oh, can you spend more time on that? Or that was too fast. Um, I'm always um, trying to speak through so we can get to questions. So we can take, there's, I see there's some hands up in the chat space. So maybe we'll start there. Yes, we have a couple questions in the uh, chat. One of them is, I have a question about the patients when a student uses this only for a small part of the assignment or edits heavily the output versus the student who submits text only generated by AI. How do we guide students on what they should decide? You can pull up the chat so you can look at the... So I think the question, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, Victoria. Um, it's I think the question is about me. sort of like uh, being clear in guidance about what students should say and how. Does that get at the question? So yes, Allison, I'm the question is from me, Betsy. Hi. So the first thing is being clear from the beginning about what it's okay to use AI to do. So if your position is, you can't submit a paper that was completely composed, drafted, edited, and wholesale written by generative AI. Students should know that before they submit. But then the question gets more complicated as things become more granular, right? So like if, if you say, you can use Grammarly to not just uh, make suggestions for your grammar, but also expand your ideas or shorten your ideas or do some of the um, more, what I would consider composing work that Grammarly can offer, then I would say it's it's a lot harder to put, to like contain that. Um, you can ask students to do things like some tools have a function where you can get it to cite itself, to like 
not just cite itself, but also kind of produce um, a list of what it did. So like you can say, cite my session with Grammarly and Grammarly will give you kind of a list of like what you asked, like what your prompts were, what the responses were to the prompts, right? That creates an enormous amount of text depending on how it was used. But if you're considering allowing students to do all of that with Grammarly and you wanna know how they did it, then something like that would be really useful. Did that answer the question? Well, I think, uh, uh, Betsy is on I, mute so she can. Yeah, um, I'm, can okay. you hear me yeah, now? Let me clarify if, you, if I didn't get yeah. to what you Yeah, thought. no, that's, so I'm looking at this, one of your early slides when you had the. I need to have the sound on, on your computer. Can you hear me now? My, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Um... Allison, can you hear me now? Sorry, I can't hear you, Betsy. I'm unmuted, so and my audio is on. So it's like up here. I can unmute it, but I don't see it. Um, Stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just unplug. Can you hear me now? So it's okay, Betsy. I can hear you now. Start again. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So what I was trying to say was, um, from one of your early slides where it had the, um, and first of all, thank you, Allison, for this and all of your work on this. You know, when it says you had, for example, text generated by ChatGPT, OpenAI, August seventh, twenty twenty three, and then the the link to the URL. Well, I. You know, I want to know how much is actually generated by, you know, was generated by AI because let's say they used it to, like you said, they use it to brainstorm versus they used it to get a few sources. And so how is it that they um, can differentiate as a citation and um, and maybe, or even to say, I, I, I used it to brainstorm, but then I threw out most of it and I only used a piece of it. Yeah. Versus, really you fun know, fun. versus the student who basically uses the whole text that's generated, at which point I am not spending my time trying to help them improve their writing. Yeah. So I think I don't know that I have a good answer for that in part because I don't think citation styles like MLA, APA, Chicago, and I don't think our professional um, outlets or journal article, you know, journals and professional organizations have a good answer for that either. Um, except to say, um, I want to see exactly what you asked chat GPT to do. And I want to see exactly what it produced for you. So it's almost like what it seems like what you really want is like, I want the whole readout. Like I want the entire um, soup to nuts of your process. Like I put this into the prompt. This is what came out. Then I did this, then I did that. And that's actually, I mean, there's something really wonderful about that as far as kind of exposing a process, but then it raises a million questions about like, are you going to read that? How are you yeah, going to read exhausted. that? <laughs> right? It's exhausting just thinking about like an entire chat GPT readout. And so it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I guess I would say, I have to think about it more to give specific guidance because if you're dealing with like a whole paper where the whole thing has been generated by chat GPT and a student can't explain it or can't talk about it or can't say what they prompted the tool to do, you know, it might be one of those things that you ask them to show you if it's necessary. So like in the syllabus or in the assignment, you say something like, um, you should be prepared to talk to me about every single prompt and you should be able to recreate these for yourself. So keep them for yourself. Maybe don't turn them in, but if I ask you, I want to see them, you have them. Um, that's something that's connected to what I've recommended to faculty, which is tell students they should expect to talk about their work and they should expect to talk about their process, not in a like prove to me, this is yours kind of way, but in a like, let's talk about your work because that's what you're doing here. Um, so yeah, I'm that, not sure. Yeah. Yeah, that that still sort of sends me into are you cheating as opposed to what I want to ask. I want to just give them great gu guidance. And so I'm the I'm I'm really just thinking about this for the first time. So I'm wondering maybe to ask them to put a footnote or a memo that says 
you know, in how did you use AI, you know, and what did you do with the output? Yeah, I think the memo is probably the best, the best you can do at this point for something that's short enough that you could actually read it and grade it. Um, and then say, like, I would put a disclaimer in the assignment saying like, you're going to need to produce this, this reflection memo. Keep in mind, I might ask you for more detail at any point, including your search, your, you know, your prompt history and the history of the outputs that you're creating. I mean, it should feel to students like it's more work to use these tools than not because it is like, they're not, they're like for students, these are not like intuitive tools um, back to the sort of like digital natives. Like they're not troubleshooters. They should be hard for the students to use because they're not capable of producing the things students want to produce with the level of knowledge or uh, like adaptability with these technologies as they, they, they don't have those. So, well, for what it's worth to everybody, you can use my story and you probably have your own, which is I used it yesterday, ChatGPT, the unpaid version. So it's the cheaper one. Um, and I asked it for some stuff and it gave me uh, two authors to look at and I and titles. And then when I looked in the journals that they said they were in those titles and did not exist, I asked for the full citations and it gave me full citations and they, they did not exist. I think that's also a good um, reminder of something to put on an assignment sheet that like students are always responsible for work that they submit. Even it, like if they're using a citation that was generated by chat GPT and it doesn't exist, students are responsible for that. And that's when you call me, that's an academic integrity code violation. That's fabrication of data. This is like, this is what's been the most straightforward for us, for my office to look at is sources that don't exist. And I know that, um, and, and it kind of exacerbates something that I think many of us have experienced with student source use, which is like this, I need to throw in a source because there's a couple that are required. Um, it's like a way of thinking about research that is not natural for us to think about in academia, right? And so um, there are tools, Purdue OWL is one um, that now has an AI powered component where you can just type in a, a term and it will give you sources and you can cite them. So you never have to even open a source. It's come, it's, it's uh, affiliated with EasyBib. Um, and so like you might get a citation and it might be for a real source, but you know, it might never be sort of open. We've got a question right here. And then I think I saw another hand on the, on the chat. So we'll go in person and then back to Zoom. Uh, this is more of my thoughts on this rather than specific questions. So I've been thinking about the purpose of citation. It's, it's two things. One is so that whoever's reading it could go and consult it if necessary. Yep. And that's not possible to do in, the, uh, in an AI citation because it's not going to be the same thing. That's right. So that would make it more difficult. But the other is it's also indicating you're including the correct citation, right? yeah. the quality of, of sources. So there are some papers where some you have to cite the canon and cite specific literature, and then you can also cite like an online web page or something. Yes. And there is all citations are not equal. Yeah. I'm wondering where AI would fit in that spectrum. Because I like to I, I tend to like the Wikipedia approach to citation where they don't care if it's a book or a blog post, as long as you have something that verifies the information, it's accessible on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. But in academia, we tend to have gradations for what counts as a good citation or not. Yeah. Um, so where would AI fit in that spectrum if, if, if at all it fits there? That's a great question. Okay, so the comment uh, uh, reminded us that we use citation for a couple of reasons. One is to create a trail for other researchers to follow. And another is to kind of gain authority for ourselves, right? Good researchers go look at um, materials of others that are reputable, that are themselves well-researched, that we trust, right? And so in this world of, of AI, what's, what's um, helping, what, what do, how can we navigate uh, what maybe in the worst sense becomes the sort of democratization of research, if that makes sense? I mean, it's like it, uh, all sources are not created equal, right? And so um, I think the most important way to address that to me is an investment in information literacy learning. That um, if we help students navigate, like what I see at its core in some of the behaviors of students 
uh, with generative AI tools and research are the same issues that I saw before generative AI became a mass market tool, um, which is to say, a lot of students don't understand like why we do research because in high school or in assignments that feel like, well, the goal is to get this paper done so I can get an A, not the goal is so I can make new knowledge and share it with other people or contribute to um, a community of ideas or influence the way people think, behave and live in the world, right? Those are like really big possibilities that at a university, our students are just beginning to learn of the possibilities of research. And so I would say part of what helps them make that move is all of our collective investment in teaching them sort of how to be critical about information, how to think about information, how to recognize that, inf that information collection and thinking about information and research is a process. Um, and that um, that process should be guided by our inquiry and not our need for five things, right? Um, that that process should be um, uh, kind of attenuated by um, critical thinking about the authority or the context of that source in, in its relationship to the messages we're trying to make. And so I feel like the only way through it to me, a lot of the like strategies that I always propose are actually very similar to the ones that I proposed about academic integrity concerns and concerns about research bef before this moment. And so I would say that for me, that's how I think about the way through. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think someone on the Zoom had a question, but I can't remember who it was. Oh, hi. hi, this is Patricia. I'm from the Spanish language program. I wanted to kind of follow up on what Betsy was saying about how do we really know what the student, uh, you know, what exactly have they done? And could, it, could request them to provide the chat history would be a way in which they have to be fully transparent because we they know we are going we have the potential to go back into the chat history and see exactly how they use um um the ai technology the ai yes i think i think that is a, a fair and okay thing to do my suggestion if you're thinking about doing that is to let students know beforehand so like okay. the details you give to us to students about the assignment you should mm -hmm. know be keeping track of your search history, keep these in your files or in whatever kind of repository makes sense for your class. You can say, I may ask you to see this, so keep track of it. Um, I, I generally- Could we ask, for example, if we give them an assignment and we allow them to use ChatGPT and we tell them specifically how the, it's supposed to be used, you know, brainstorming, or we're very specific about it. Mm -hmm. And with the assignment specifically, we say that for this assignment, you are expected to provide your chat history. Um, is that something that we, in which we can verify and also hold them accountable for following what we are requesting them to do? Yes, I think it is okay to ask for the chat history as long as you're asking for it like upfront. So nobody's gonna okay. be surprised when they submit their assignment and you say, I wanna see your chat history. And they're like, okay. wait, what? I didn't save it. Um, so mm -hmm. you. I would emphasize that a lot because sometimes students don't go through the process we think they're going through when it comes mm -hmm. to or drafting assignments. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, be really transparent about what you want them to show you and like when and how, and as long as you give them that in advance. I will also say like my advice for faculty in general is if you're gonna talk to students after they've submitted a paper, um, my advice is, uh, is not to take an accusatory tone or to um, or to like set them up to sort of prove that the work is that students have like, our research is definitely showing that a lot of students are feeling anxiety about being asked to prove work is their own. This is part of why amongst other reasons, um, we don't have the Turnitin AI detection tool enabled right now. Um, one is because uh, it's wrong sometimes, we're uncomfortable with that, but also because our students are saying to us, um, I feel worried that I'm going to be accused of using chat GPT when I didn't, and how will I prove this work is mine, right? And so I, I, I'm always advising faculty, like, instead of accusing, us, if, you, if you feel like I need to accuse this, do you use chat GPT, then call me or call our office 
and we can sort of talk through what the best strategy is. But if your inclination is to sit down with a student and say, tell me about your process or tell me about what the tools that you used for help or did you use Grammarly for this project in a way that has more of a um, kind of teacherly approach rather than an accusatory, I'm going to catch you, I'm going to I'm going to find out that you are um, dishonest kind of vibe. So stay away. From, I would advise you to stay away from the latter, lean towards the former. Call me if you feel like there's no way this student didn't use chat GPT for the entirety of this assignment um, and, and we'll go from there. Um, but yeah, you definitely can ask for um, things that would help you understand the student's use of those tools, especially if it's upfront. Thank and you. Betsy, your point is true. Like it's confusing for students who have, and this will happen absolutely in the fall. Our students will have five different classes with five different AI policies. And that is actually probably the best case scenario. Um, what's probably going to be more true is that they've got three classes with AI policies and two classes with none. Um, and so that's going to be really confusing for them too. I mean, we have a lot of things in our academic space where like, that are different from class to class, right? Like um, my policy about uh, absences may be different from your policy about absences, right? And students kind of have to navigate that. Like they know that there are certain things that are true in one class that are not true in the other. But this is, this is new and this is different. And it's gonna be different for our first year students. It's gonna be different from the way it was in high school. Um, from what I've read for uh, um, grade 12 use of chat GPT, um, it's extremely common. Um, and it's not very uh, considered. There's not a lot, there was not a lot of discussions happening. It looks like there are many students who use um, chat GPT to do things like write their um, admissions essays and things like that. Uh, and so um, it's gonna be a huge variety of experiences that our students are bringing in um, in the fall. I see that we're just at time. I'm happy to take, happy to hang out either digitally or here to take more questions. Also by email, any questions come up, um, feel free. I'll put it in the chat here so you all have it, but A. Thomas at American. I've got a session tomorrow afternoon about the Purdue OWL um, and sort of changing um, technologies that have AI power these days. Um, and then Friday is a kind of all day AI conversation and um, look at resources and tools. So thank you so much for taking the time on the, this beautiful afternoon. And um, hopefully I'll see you all again soon. If not, have a great first semester. <laughs>